Darren Oli, and thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast today. Oh, man, I am stoked beyond belief to be here for sure. We're stoked. We're Canadian <laughs> stoked for you to be here. Um, this is super awesome. You know, we've been following you a while, of course, watch Down to Earth, and we're grateful that you're here. And we wanted to know if you have a moment of gratitude to share with us and the listeners. I tell you what, I, I, there's so much gratitude that pours out. Uh, I start my day every day with a list of at least 30 things that I'm grateful for. Right now, I am literally grateful to be here with you guys, hearing a little bit about your story just before this, and to be able to share from our experience, both you and I, to listeners, to have them tune and attune in. Um, I'm really grateful to share the time right here, right now with you guys. Oh, thank you for that. It's, it's so amazing that we have the opportunity to share our stories and share what's happened to us and how the food we consume has impacted our lives and given me a new life. And it's pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, and we watched the series Down to Earth on Netflix with you and Zach Efron, and it was a huge hit in our home. But before we get into that, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you got into a plant-based lifestyle and into your whole superfood realm. <laughs> yeah, I'll keep it. I'll keep it short because it's definitely a lot. Sorry. Of, a lot of a lot of things, but. But I say that, um, you know, I, I grew up in Minnesota, uh, in the Midwest. My grandfather sold tractors in South Dakota. My grandmother came over, a Norwegian uh, came over on a covered wagon and fed Indians uh, in the plains of South Dakota. My father was an ag professor at the University of Minnesota. Um, just a, kind of felt like a normal kid, except that, you know, I was born premature uh, I almost died on birth, and it, it sent the the idea and the real life uh, understanding at that particular time that we're fragile, and um, this is dangerous. So that informed me um, definitely at a core level. But then, really, just being a regular kid, I just started, uh, you know, playing around with picking up weights when I was sixteen and playing with food and literally realizing that I was medicating with, you know, bottles of Coke, six bottles of Coke a day as a kid, um, kind of stimulating myself into a different um, sense of myself and then realizing that food and exercise just massively shifted everything um, and really cut to, you know, once I became stronger and kind of combated this, this idea that I had growing up that the thing that I'm fragile um, I played college football, got hurt, had a career ending back injury. And then it was that light bulb moment, that blessing, uh, that occurred underneath what was very, uh, troubling and depressive. Uh, and that was, you know, why don't I study this stuff? Why don't I study this kind of miraculous thing, this body, this physiology, the nutrition. And then from there, that just was like, wow, uh, not only is this so complex, I can barely hang on, it's cool, but it was just the miraculousness also came in very clearly. And then, uh, and then kind of after college, um, I did a lot of exercise physiology and nutrition stuff. And, and that was kind of cool at a certain point. Then I studied psychology because I was, I got a master's in psychology and I was really try to figure out what was so miraculous about so many things and why you could do one thing for one person and it get a completely different result, kind of seemingly doing the same thing for another. Uh, and then just exploring who I am. And I think that, and that hasn't stopped to this day. Um, but really the, 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 the superfood hunting side of it came just kind of naively. I just, the more I was studying, the more I started to play with formulas and herbs and botanicals, you know, coming from where I came from, I had to go meet the farmers, the collectors. I had to see where these were coming from. I had to learn from them. 
because that was kind of at the genesis of what I believed. Um, so it had to be people to people. And that just so happened to be jumping on planes and showing up in the middle of nowhere and jungles and mountaintops and everything in between. And, and then, you know, I kind of got uh, blessed with some great job opportunities from there and, and things kind of blew up. It sounds like you mixed a little bit of in- inquisitivity with uh, mm-hmm. intuition and kind of just followed the path and, you know, dug deep and, and, and followed it. So you, you talked about back injury in high school from playing football. Is that an injury that kept with you a long time? Were there any health changes that happened over time as you got deeper into the nutrition quest? Yeah, it actually was in college. So I got the, the it was a college ending foot, uh, mm-hmm. football injury. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I think honestly, it's still it's still there for me today. Um, it doesn't stop me from things, but I have to be super mindful of of my movement. Uh, and, and also, it's driven me down It's kind of at the root the, the, the sacral plexus uh, was where it got damaged. Um, and it, it kind of is this weird, not that I want an injury, but it's infinitely better. But I think number one, to, to answer your question is because the natural, even physical therapists and doctors and trying to find, find out like what's wrong. Well, I tore a bunch of ligaments and they couldn't, create stability again so that definitely was like well they're not helping and so i i doubled down on nutrition because i feel like the foundation for my body to rebuild is definitely what i'm putting in my mouth and then you know learning and studying movement um which then you know i could put on pads today and play so it's not like i couldn't but um but I think now it still informs me to this day because if I kind of unconsciously uh, move around or let stress happen or build up in my life, that lower back will will uh, show up and just be a friendly reminder. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a growing, maturing relationship. I think it's really interesting that you had the interest and the need to go find out where these foods are coming from and jumping on planes and whatever method you got to these places and farms and people. I don't think a lot of people on this planet are so interested in where their food is actually coming from. And if they were, perhaps they would change some of the foods that they would consume on a regular basis. Do you want to talk to that connection a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, it's a big connection. It's actually the start of, you know, these segments of the show, the, the my podcast that I do called Fatal Conveniences. And that's really industry-wide in every level of industry. Uh, food, supplements, cl- clothing, personal care. But it really started from from when I was looking at supplements. And seeing what people were marketing and then seeing these poor quality supplements and going, number one, and it was really, I was actually working with some people and I was working with their ingredients and I tested them and I looked looked at them really closely and I, I kind of said, oh, these aren't what they're even saying to me as a manufacturer to, a, to another business. And so I called them out on it. I said, do you realize that what these, what your, what are in here is is inactive and dead, and it's got these chemical derivatives in there, and and they were shocked. They didn't even look, and I I believe that there's there's two forms of kind of destruction in this area. One is there's naivete, so you don't even you just believe whatever you know, uh, a manufacturer or a company tells you or shows you, but you haven't done the test yourself, but you believe them. So you don't do the test. You're like, well, they did it. It's official. It's on a lab report. Cool. That's the naive side. The other side is knowingly, uh, taking poor quality ingredients or food. 
So, and that both happen. Uh, largely the naivete is people just don't have the time or resources to really s spend on really knowing what their ingredients, if they're making an ingredient or a formula that has 10 ingredients in it. And if they really looked at every one of those ingredients and did the kind of tests, it would be hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and they haven't even sold a product. So, so there's that side of it. So I think, yeah, that and the more, and then when I was in countries, I would look at food systems. I would look at the ways people were processing and I was like, oh my God, I'd be in situations right now where I could name off top 10 companies that are using these types of ingredients that I saw the source of them. And I was like, they don't even know. Or if they do, uh, this is uh, playing Russian roulette because it's about the, you're going to have a contamination. So, so it's, so that was like, you know, the small town kid from Minnesota that's, that's honest and believes what people say and why would people lie? You know, that, that whole upbringing, I realized, oh, that's not how people are. That's not how they conduct themselves. Uh, so, so that naive way of starting this process also uncovered this other kind of less than optimal side of the business. And so that's, that's kind of the, I mean, the, the long story short is that the reason I do fatal convenience is I expose products that are harming us that we don't know about so that we can have a power over the, the exposure that they're, they're causing us. Um, and that was really birthed by seeing what I saw in the supplement industry. I think that there's some very good points there, especially that people want to power their bodies up with superfoods and they're willing to spend the money on the, you know, $25 package of maca and the, and the this and the that. And A, they don't really know the source of where it's coming from. They don't know if they could trust the company, but they're doing that to counteract the Coca-Cola and the fast food and they need to recognize the power and you've talked about it all the, the the healing power of the foods that we do put into us but how toxic some of these small things can really be for the body and and we we need a, a better balance really in north america is what we need yeah it's 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 kind of astonishing every time i do one of these kind of reveals um it's it's still shocking like I still I'm reading this stuff and it, and then you you're, you're realizing that there's Teflon, uh, a Teflon coating on our on our dental care. Right. So uh, and you're like, what the hell is going on? Like you're putting Teflon that's causing liver and kidney damage that's already in the public. It's in the published data. And then you look at you turn over your 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 toothpaste is propylene glycol Uh and your your clothing has hormone disrupting formaldehyde, and so you just look at all this stuff, and no one adds up all that stuff. They're just sitting in their little thing with very little studies at all in their little products and their ingredients, and then you add all this up, and we're we're living in a toxic soup. And so you can spend all your money. Not to I'm not even getting into the quality of the superfoods because. You know, I just read a study today on maca specifically, and, and, and now that China and the Czech Republic has stolen uh, maca out of the country, which is a, a, a biopiracy from a Peruvian government standpoint, uh, that they have different constituents in them. And they have uh, pesticides showing up, and now, but it's all being blended together. So you've got so, that, so I'm barely even talking about the superfoods. Like, let's say they're perfectly pure, which they're not. But then you have all this other stuff. So you're trying to be healthy. You're eating perfectly. You're spending your money, your hard-earned money on high-quality foods. And that's extremely important. But at the same time, we're literally being overrun by toxicity. So it's really hard to just eat because it's like showing up to a forest fire with a squirt gun on the toxic side. So it's these two things that we really need to keep in balance and be aware of so that we can make other choices. 
this isn't to say that we're doomed. This is just to say that there's a problem here. We're normally used to doing it this way by doing, you know, eating this or using this or using this shampoo. But over here, there's an easy solution. There's great botanical based uh, food grade stuff now that you, you can replace. So, so there's this, it's this interesting world between, which is why I called it fatal convenience. It's this modern day world that we've allowed profit to, to overrun even the good intentions that some of these organizations, the FDA, the USDA, the FCC, all these organizations in their inception had a start of a good intention. But now there's just infinitely conflicts of interest. So we kind of have to take our power back by kind of doing the work ourselves. And that's kind of one of the missions that I'm on right now. So if we're living in this toxic soup, as you called it right now, how does the average person get out of that mixture and start paying a little bit more attention without doing so much research? Because the average person, let's be honest, does not want to dive into that. They just want to be told what to eat what to do, and they just want to do it, especially since everybody's so into the quick, quick fix kind of thing. Yeah, well, the one thing, I'd answer that a couple ways. One is that we need to take responsibility for ourselves in our life. So we do need to take a higher level of, of responsibility of what is going on us and also what's going in us. Uh, so that's number one. And, and, that, that, and, and if you don't take that responsibility, some other... Uh, entity, some other persons, uh, some other products is going to influence you if you don't influence your choice. So it's a waking up first, waking up to not everything in your home, on your children and baby products to whatever is safe. So wake up to that fact. And that's a continuous wake up. It's like you don't just uh, end up as Buddha under the tree, fully enlightened. Life is about, I think, uncovering uh, and becoming more and more aware. That's number one. Number two is, I mean, like that's why I'm doing these fatal conveniences to wake people up. They're 15 minutes, you know, and you can go, cool. Now I know what shampoo not to use. I can use this one. Now I know what dental floss to use. Cool. Now I know what kind of water to drink, how to create clean water. It's just steps. So it's just a matter of, um, you know, getting the basics, making sure definitely the food that you're consuming is healthy. Uh, it's organic. Maybe it's biodynamic. Maybe it's from your local farmer. Support them. Do all of that. Absolutely. Uh, and then just slowly start educating yourself about the water, uh, your, your, the clothing you're putting on, the personal care products you're using. Um, you know, because unfortunately, mercury in our our deodorant uh, is not a good idea. And it's lymphatically pulling that in and direct cause to breast cancer uh, in formaldehyde and bras and all of that stuff. So it's a continuous um, thing. And I also just just uh, I'm signing a, a book, a new book deal, and I'm really going to create a fatal convenience book so that we can really hammer that and. Um, so it's, it's, I don't, I don't know how I fell into that, but it was it, actually, I do know I, I described it, but I was just looking at it from a supplement standpoint, but now it's like, once my eyes are open, uh, it's hard for me not to continue to share the information. So, so yeah, I think as a general thing, uh, as people wake up, uh, don't be overwhelmed by all of the information. Just take one step. And I think that's the big thing is one step at a time. And even on our plant-based journey, it started with food. It started with eliminating the animal products. Then we got more into organic. Then we started to say, huh, what can we do to help the world? What can we do to help the animals? And it was all a big progress to the point where we don't even use soap for our laundry anymore. We use those... Um, what are those? Soap nuts. Soap nuts. Oh, yeah. Right? Those yeah. Are beautiful. You know, yeah. it comes in a paper box. There is no, there's nothing added to it. It it lasts a long time and everything smells clean. And, you know, but that's not something I would have been able to handle 
at the beginning of just changing our our diet when I still had all of when we're still dealing with all these health issues that that we needed to eliminate also. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, I mean, obviously, one of the most intimate things that we're doing is opening our mouth up to this world and we're putting things into it. So that for sure, that's your starting point, right? And cleaning that part up and lessening and eliminating the, the processed, you know, food in bags and bottles and all of this stuff and whole healthy foods for sure. The way you started is the way I would recommend. And then as you kind of gain more energy, gain more awareness, uh, and feel better, that's the interesting thing, right? It's like when we feel better, we have also more to give and you naturally then continue down this path and it's just attuning yourself to what feels right for you in your life. And that, that is a very important side of it because, you know, great. I'm eating plants because it makes me feel good. But at the same time, now I'm supporting a healthier environment. Uh, now I'm supporting not killing animals. Uh, and, and those are major congruences, uh, that, that just fuel the energy moving forward in one's life. And I, I certainly uh, am in the same boat. I started eliminating and then it just continues from there and it's going to still continue. So we've been talking a little bit about superfoods. We're going to get into down to earth in a moment. You do have a book out that is called Super Life, The Five Simple Fixes That Will Make You Healthy, Fit and Eternally Awesome. So I just wanted to mention that for our audience. But when we talk about superfoods, we we usually talk about things that are rare and hard to find in the big North American cities. And I'm wondering that for our listeners who maybe don't have enough money to buy a specific superfood or like your favorite Camu Camu is not available to them, like how... What what foods would you think are also superfoods that are not getting that superfood kind of qu air quote category? Yeah, and, that, and that's part of the funny thing about the the, the whole marketing of superfoods too. But you know, yeah, there's medicinal qualities to some of these superfoods and super herbs. But but some of the basics. I mean, you've got turmeric that's available everywhere. Uh, you've got ginger. Uh, these are some of the most ancient used. Uh, herbal tonics and anti-inflammatory and uh, immune system modulators. Uh, those, so those are, those are awesome. But also you have to look at, again, the quality of where it's coming from. Spend a little extra money on finding the, the farmers that are close to you and, and their soils that are healthy. Help bring your family, bring, bring your children out to see, uh, make that connection to where they are actually coming from. Make a, make a weekend field trip and, and then have that association with the soil and so you can largely say that the health of the soil is creating the superfoods so if it's you know super spinach that's coming up as a result of this golden powerful soil uh then that's it that's your superfood because next to it from a uh a spinach that was created and you know picked too early and driven across america and 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 frozen uh not that there's anything wrong with that because if you that's your choice that's your choice uh and that's absolutely better than nothing but what i'm saying is start kind of extrapolating and looking at how you can support yourself even more by knowing where your food's from knowing the farmer and getting together make your little own little cooperative find someone who's growing hell there's there's some organizations going on now in, in L.A. where people are literally transforming their lawn, which is ridiculous, to just spray uh, grass. Uh, why not just create food? And it's you can go out and pick your salad every day. Um, so you can transform. I don't care if you're sitting on uh, one acre to a third of an acre to – like a front yard that has barely anything you can grow food. So that that's, I think where we need to go. And, and it's really about the, the atmosphere, the soil. Uh, and that's what makes the superfood. I think what, why 
why is superfood even a term? Because we absolutely know that the food that we've created since the 1930s and even before that, and the dust bowl that we created from monocropping in the Midwest, we knew that we wiped out the soil. And if the soil's not healthy, it can't transmute the nutrients into the plant. And the plant is just there genetically, but it really doesn't have the constituents that we need. Uh, it doesn't have the active compounds, doesn't have the micronutrients, doesn't have the vitamins and minerals. So it's really that. I think we just need to look at, you know, kale, uh, spinach, chard, whatever, but look at who you're getting it from and how they're growing it. That's the super, I think, in the food that we really need to kind of get back and not be overwhelmed by you have to buy all of this stuff. Now, that all again, superfoods are great, especially when we're dealing with the weird world we're in. Like we're all looking to keep ourselves as strong as possible. Um, but the foundation, you need to absolutely include whole healthy food. I love that. I think our son will be disappointed that you didn't say broccoli, but but we we know you were thinking Bro it. <laughs> now that one, that one is the, the easiest thing for people to do. Get broccoli seeds, get a mason jar, uh, have a little mesh top on the, and you can put seeds in there and and create broccoli sprouts, which are hundreds of times more strong than the actual broccoli and the sulforaphanes and the immune modulation. And the support. So that's, again, you don't even have to let the broccoli grow to full maturity. You can let the easy, within five days, you'll have a jar full of some of the greatest superfoods ever uh, that you can add on all, all your salads. And that's probably cost you, you know, seven cents. But that quality of seed is important as well. Organic seed. Yep, exactly. I can't believe I heard you mention that people in LA are spraying grass onto their lawns. That's like mind blowing to me. I would think that they would be putting food in their garden, which is what we're trying to do up here in Toronto, where we get winter and all that food is just dead because it can't grow, which is why we got inspired by one of the episodes in Down to Earth. And we're talking about building a green wall a live wall in our kitchen nice. because that was one of the coolest things that we saw. It was beautiful. It's so practical. And for anybody that's listening that doesn't know what I'm talking about, we're talking about an episode that was on Netflix from the series Down to Earth with Zach Efron and Darren Olean was in that one. So people should go check out that series. We watched it with our kids and we loved it. It was a fantastic series and we want to talk a little bit about that today too. Yeah. What was the driving force behind that? The whole, uh, the whole there's a lot of driving forces for sure. I mean, well, number one, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the story goes that uh, Zach had reached out to me from a podcast that he had heard me on and I never knew him. And so he ran it months and months later. He had reached out uh, via text and we got together and we just discussed health fitness, superfoods, everything else. And then just at the very end, I had this idea of what I wanted to do as a, sh as a show and just said, I'm going to do this regardless somehow um, because I want to expand into the environment, into what I've seen as I've traveled around the world. And he just was like, he just lit up. Um, and this was literally within, you know, two or three hours of us meeting for the first time. And then and then we were like, cool, cool, we'll be in touch and whatever. And and then he called me a couple hours later and he said, I think I think I can I think we can do this uh, TV show. And I was like, what? Uh, and he goes, I have an existing deal with Netflix. But I don't want to do that concept. And that concept was just kind of running around with other celebrities and just eating in exotic areas and it was kind of food based and it was probably fun, but he didn't want to do it. Uh, he saw the mission behind this one. He saw that it had a lot more of what he cared about. And he, and he said one thing that changed it all for me. Uh, he said, I have, you know, this platform that I want to use for good. And, um, and Zach's very sweet kid, as you've 
seen that he's very much the same person uh, that you saw on the show. And, and so we melded or molded these two concepts. And, and so, yeah, I, I, I just, you know, I, I wanted to start talking about water and the miraculousness of it. I wanted to start talking about um, longevity. I wanted to start talking about where food's from and where the medicinal plants are from. And, and then it came together by the production team who wasn't necessarily didn't live from the space, a couple of them. But it really was this uh, idea of how could it be fun, adventurous, educational. So I actually had to let go of a lot of my agendas that I wanted to kind of hammer even harder. And it, and it was tough. It was really tough to surrender that. There's a couple points where earlier in filming where I was just like, I don't think I'm going to do this. Because it was like... It was a Holly, you know, just not that Zach was being any particular way, but it was just like I never wanted to do anything that would that would compromise what I care about. And I saw myself early on having to kind of let go of like, wait a minute, we can't get this expert. I already talked to him. We can't do this. We can't do this. And I come to find out that over time, I trusted the team that was on the ground with us. And, and they also were great at what they did to tell a story. So it, it, I, I, I can't say that I wasn't nervous even the night before it came out because, you know, I, I didn't want it to be, you know, kind of greenwashed, you know, in a sense. But what I discovered was that that balance of being fun caring, adventurous, uh, was more inviting than us or me or the experts lecturing people and just hitting them over the head with so much information. What it did was it reached over and grabbed a bunch of people that weren't necessarily seeing this or looking at it. And so from that perspective, it became a hell of a success more than I could have imagined. It was super interesting to watch. I really felt that there was that sense of adventure and it did give a lot of education for people that had no clue about some of these topics, whether it be water or sustainability or the superfoods that you found. It was really cool because when you watch these, this kind of show with a 10-year-old and a 12-year-old and they're super excited to check out these cool places that you're going to and learn about these important pieces of our planet that they would never have known about. I think it was really cool to see. And they were really excited to see the next one. Oh, where are we going next, guys? Let's go. Like it was, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Mommy, will you take me to France? Will you take me to Paris? <laughs> but now they want to they want to check these things out and they express interest in what's going on. Oh, wow. What they did in Peru looks really cool. And oh, that's where those superfoods come from. Or sardinia with these old people that are living for so many years how are they doing that and it's just very interesting to go to all these places and learn from what's going on in our planet that most people don't even know about and don't see on a regular basis and and the kids have finally said i always say i want to just go live in a treehouse in costa rica and and they'll laugh at me and now they're like yeah can we go can we go to a treehouse in in yeah, yeah. in costa rica and shout out to marav who i play catch ball with because she sent me a a, a whatsapp and she's like have you heard of this blue zone place and i'm like <laughs> well yeah she's like she's like there's this there's this documentary out and you have to watch it and it would be right up your alley um, so she, she turned me onto it and, and it was, so people are starting to you to use vocabulary that we've been using for years and it just, it makes it so much more at level and easy because it's not somebody preaching to them. You are telling a story every time. Yeah. It's, it, again, it's, it's the, it's the, that's it. The telling of the story so that people can receive it. You, we've all seen those documentaries, especially in this space where you kind of walk away going, I'm kind of more depressed mm. than I'm inspired. And it's not to say that the information's wrong. More oftentimes it's right. It's very right. 
but how how do you use that information to then uplift and inspire and and i you know thank god they bleeped us uh so that uh number one we could be natural and swear and we did all that stuff but they bleeped it which is great because then it was able to be seen uh with your children and that i mean just hearing that that your children i've heard it so many times now that children and everyone was entertained by the show which is like unheard of right it's just like so something we hit uh just you know we're just the whole team the whole crew we're just over the moon uh excited and and hopefully keep going what was that one really big impact you were hoping to make once you kind of knew what the what the new vision was? Well, I think, you know, it was kind of discovered. It was kind of revealed to me. I don't know what my ultimate intention was starting it other than I wanted to show people things that they haven't seen. Um, I think the most powerful and is still happening is the Gen Z's, the, the young kids that are waking up, that want to do something, that are inspired to do something and want to take action. I have been spending a lot of time cultivating and con conversing with kids like that and universities in this last couple months, figuring out ways to cultivate peer to peer support so that these kids can have a place to go where they, cause they don't know where to go. They don't know, they don't know who to trust. They don't know where to go to take that action. Um, and rightly so you don't know where your dollars are going from. If you donate all the time, you don't know what they're doing with those dollars, if they're even effective. Um, and so, and then transparency within companies, like who's actually doing good with the businesses that they're creating. So it's all of this stuff that, that, that to me is still firing me up and fueling me today, but seeing the awakening of kids in that space, uh, that's probably the greatest gift for sure. So I, and I don't want to ruin the series for anybody who hasn't watched it yet, but there was a point where you got back to your place in L.A. and it was devastated by the fires that are happening in, in L.A. And I know it's probably a sensitive topic for you, uh, but the fires overtook your complete home. And I'm hoping that since then things have been rebuilt and you're in a better place. But I wanted to kind of get a feel for what happened after because we didn't see that part and what your next steps were and also what's contributing to all those fires that we could help change on our planet to kind of help reduce those fires if that's even possible uh number one that is possible uh but yeah that's a that's a big topic and i'm very engaged in um so number one i mean now that i've gone through the grief I'm cool with the conversation uh, because it's also gifted me more than it's actually taken away in a weird sort of way. Um, but it was devastating, utterly gutting. Uh, next to losing my father, it was one of the hardest things uh, to that than I've ever gone through. The, the problem is that when the loss happens, that's one thing. But that's actually not the hardest part. The hardest part is after that. The hardest part is the next year where you're, you're trying to get back on the property. And it's nothing here. There's not a blade of grass. There was, there was nothing I could recover from the property. We're talking 50 acres surrounded by the national park, barns, uh, trucks, uh, you know, equipment, motorcycles, house, bridges, uh, thousands of trees like wiped out. So the important thing is that it's very important for us to grieve. And so by allowing myself to grieve allowed me to just healthfully move through that energy. And once I did, I was utterly excited, like 
inspired in a way that I've never been. And I'm fairly passionate person. I'm fairly driven. I, I've always lived that way. But, the, but what that gave me, like literally gave me the, the fortitude, more strength, more heart centeredness, more clarity on what I'm doing on this planet, for what reason, for why I'm doing it and what I'm going to do. And, and what I'm doing is exactly that health, health of people so that people can be stronger and more powerful to live the life that they want, period. I don't care if they have six pack abs. I don't give a shit about any of that stuff. I just want people to be healthy so they can live their life to the fullest so that they don't have to be drug around by a body that's broken. And number two, the health of the planet. And that really isn't a climate change thing. The change is already happening. It's already, ha it's happening. It's intensifying. That's happening. I'm, I'm focused on human change within the interaction of the environment. So even though climate change is political, I'm not, I'm really common sense. So if this is happening, let's do this. So that, that's where, um, you know, I've been an environmentalist all my life. I just made a career uh, traveling in the, around the world doing this one thing, but I'm always seeing this and, and working towards the environmental side. So I've been connected to people and things and getting more connected to systems of sovereignty, food sovereignty, water sovereignty, how do we cultivate and conserve water different than what we think uh and also power sovereignty how do we how do we actually create power utilize power um start microgridding start looking at these systems this system ultimately burned our house down so it was a failed edison pole line that presumably started this whole fire um so that monopoly essentially caused one of the biggest fires in California history. So uh, I'm, I'm all about ga gaining and garnering the power of the individual as it relates to sustainability and the regeneration of the, of the earth. So from there, that tragedy gave me some of the greatest gifts ever, and I wouldn't take it back for anything. Um, and then... As it relates to California, as it relates to global fires, um, number one, we need to acknowledge where we live, everybody on the planet, hurricane, fire. I live in a fire ecology. It hasn't changed. It's always been a fire ecology. If you build without acknowledging the fire ecology, your house will burn down. It's just a matter of when. So for me, I'm making initiatives to how way the house is positioned to best suit a fire when it comes, because it will. What building materials? So I'm, I'm way down the rabbit hole on different sustainable geopolymers. There won't be, an, there won't be wood in my house at all. So uh, earth-friendly, seismic, earthquake-proof, fireproof, uh, water reclamation, food production, you know, it's that, that whole thing. So, and then I'm also working with a, uh, um, an NGO called One Tree Planted, uh, where we're going to be doing stuff in, the, in Brazil, and we're also going to be doing stuff in California, um, and creating some programs where people can go out and, and donate and get a tree in their indigenous endemic area, have that tree show up and go plant it with your children. Mm -hmm. And so I'm doing initiatives throughout California to go back and park, park uh, services and national parks and going out to, to plant trees and mobilize more people to plant trees, um, native trees, fire resistant trees, trees that are natural to this area. And then I'm going to keep pushing initiatives for, controlled burns because that's what the native Americans have always done. Uh, and we let the fuel get so 
big here that there was no chance that we weren't going to have a fire. That's pretty amazing. Thank you so much for sharing all that personal information. I mean, it's very, it must be tough and it's a tough thing to go through. So we do appreciate you sharing that with us. Do you think there's going to be another season to down to earth? I hope so. Uh, nothing's confirmed yet, but negotiations have definitely started. So yeah, if everything works out and schedules work out and budgets work out and I mean, there's a million things, it's not just turned on a switch, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the whole crew is excited at the opportunity. So we'll find out then everyone will know, I'm sure. And if you got your one vote for which theme and which location you'd like to tackle, what would that be? Well, I definitely think, um, regenerative agriculture has to be, um, talked about in a much bigger way and it has to be mobilized and act, acted upon. So, um, you can talk about regenerative agriculture anywhere. You can talk about it here in California that grows most of the U S is food. You can talk about it in the Midwest where I'm from, where we're changing over monocropping into regenerative agriculture and sequestering carbon. Um, that's probably one of the most powerful things we can do as an in, in, environment. Um, and then, you know, there's a few other things, but the, the regenerative ag definitely is at, at the top of the list. Amazing. This is uh, so, such great information. It's been amazing talking to you. Before you yeah, do that yeah. part, and I'm being sensitive to your time, our kids will be upset if we don't ask you, why Camu Camu? Why is that your why? favorite? Why is that your favorite? Oh, it's, it's, it's not necessarily, it's like, it's just one of my children. It's not like it's my <laughs> It's not like it's my favorite. I just love and and it was I knew the area we were going and I knew we'd be able to find Camu Camu to show Zach along with a few of the other um, uh, medicinal plants. But but Camu Camu is so great just because it's grows right on the Amazon. It gets flooded by the Amazon. And everyone can relate to the compound because it's vitamin C. So that one was an easy thing, I think, for people to understand that. Oh, wow. That's where that's the place where vitamin C comes from, and it you you if if anyone were to taste it, it would taste exactly like a vitamin C pill. So so that one was just an obvious one, just because of the you know we're gonna be on the boat anyway, and we're gonna run into these trees. Very got cool. It. Okay, you can go ahead. Now. Everybody's <laughs> got to go watch Down to Earth on Netflix if you haven't seen it yet. And Darren, if people want to reach out and connect with you, where would be the best places for them to go? Yeah, so they can sign up, uh, darrenolene.com, sign up for my newsletter, sign up for my uh, alerts on the podcast, uh, The Darren Olean Show. Everything's there. Baruchas is there. My, my nut out of Brazil that we're helping planting trees out of the Amazon. Uh, just Darren Olean uh, on all social medias, uh, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Um, yeah, that's, Great. that's it. Perfect. We're going to put all those links in our show notes at planttrainers.com. Darren, thank you so much for joining us on the Plant Trainers podcast. Thank you. What a pleasure. Thank you so much.